What's up, YouTube? This is Franco from Metsphere, and I am back with trying, you know, better ways to make recordings, to make it sound better, to make it look better, and for you guys to have a better learning experience. Experience. Can't talk. I've been teaching too much for today. To have a better learning experience. So today I am going to have another experimental video, and this time I'm actually going to jump to another topic, and this is the fresh water topic. So this is the IBGLV freshwater topic and we will go through it part by part and this video is actually applicable for students who are studying the IGCSE geography units as well as the ESS topics when you're learning about unit four on fresh water. So you know this video is actually beneficial for both IB geography, IB ESS and IGCSE geography students. So without further ado let's get right into it. So yeah, so I've actually recorded this video once already, and so it's kind of a little weird for me to you know, replicate my lesson again, but that's fine. So let's take a look at the IB syllabus zone on my screen. As you guys can see that the IB syllabus says the drainage basin is an open system. Wow, what is, the, oh, that wasn't what it's supposed to do. It was supposed to just highlight the word drainage basin. Okay, highlight drainage basin. Okay, the word drainage basin doesn't like me highlighting it, so you know what? I'm just gonna circle it. That should be better. So the word drainage basin. What exactly is a drainage basin? I usually tell my students, think about drainage basin as a bowl. You know, when we have a bowl and when we have water falling from elsewhere, whatever is falling within the rims of the bowls will eventually be caught in the bowl. So within that bowl, what do we have? We have you know rivers and lakes and everything like that. So that's what a drainage basin is, you know. There are different drainage basins, different bowls around the world, around different places, or even within the same country. And those will lead to uh, the water flowing into different rivers. Now, the next word is quite funny. It's called open system. So if you are my ESS student, you would know that there are three types of system, the open, the closed, and the isolated system. And an open system is where matter and energy can both go in and out of the system. Now, that's easy, right? Closed system, do you guys know what it is? Well, it is only matters, but energy cannot travel through. An isolated system is both cannot travel in and out of the system. Now, this is an interesting word. The word system, what exactly is a system? So for those students who are my ESS student again, uh, you know, system is always going to remember this. Input, process, output. The process kind of is a little weird because sometimes it's a process, sometimes they call it a flow, but the input and the output is a must. In any sort of system, we will have an input and we will have an output. Now, in a water cycle or a drainage basin, you know, what exactly are inputs? Well, it's quite simple. The input is simply precipitation. But precipitation itself doesn't mean too much. Precipitation just means rain, snow, or anything that falls from the sky that is a form of H2O, could be precipitation. Now, here's the thing. When we're learning precipitation, we need to remember three words. F, I, D. Frequency, intensity, and duration. Now, what's frequency? Frequency is how often a rainstorm occurs. What's about intensity? How strong the rainfall? Is it like drizzling? Is it raining cats and dogs? You know, the intensity of the rainfall. Duration, how long does it last? You know, five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, two hours, couple of hours. So these are the three determining factors when we look at the concept of precipitation. So do keep those in mind. Output is easy. Output is just evaporation and evapotranspiration. So what's the difference? I be love asking you a question. What happens when we have an unvegetative surface? If we have an unvegetative surface, meaning there's no plants, no plants, no transpiration. So the only output you have is evaporation. If you write transpiration, that would be wrong. You're like, oh, is there no other output? Well, there is other outputs. Water can flow into the sea or flow into an ocean or a lake. That could be counted as an output as well. But that's pretty much it for the input and output. But what's more important is you 
will be able or you need to be able to draw a diagram. This is the diagram of a water cycle. And technically in your exams, IB exams, the 10 markers, you can always draw annotated diagram. This will be helpful for you to get more marks. So without further ado, let's draw some diagrams. So first two things. So I mean, my student knows this about me already. For those of you that are not my student, you'll learn two things about me over time. One is I can't draw. The second thing is I can't spell. So don't ever ask me on spelling and don't ever criticize me on my spelling because chances are it will be wrong and you guys can just Google it. All right, so I'm not here to teach English. And you know, language ability for a lot of students might not be the forte either. So that might be beneficial for you guys to know. And I did pretty well. So even with you know poor spelling. Anyway, I would just, yeah, I would just stop on that. You guys should always learn spelling, okay? So uh, let me just make my pen a little more narrow. Okay, so here's the first thing first. After you draw a diagram like this, we need to start labeling. Okay, let's just label, well, let's, let's label it in blue. Okay, this is evaporation. That's easy. When the thing, thing, when the water is evaporated by the sun, how does it, you know, what happens when they're in the cloud? What do we call it? We call it condensation. So condensation, it, you know, condenses into a cloud. The clouds get too heavy. Eventually the clouds will rain. This is called precipitation. Precipitation. And here's the magic. The precipitation, the water, will eventually get caught by the trees. And the tree will intercept it. And this is called interception. When the interception occurs, so the leaves will get the water, the water will slowly flow down the branch into the stem. That is what we call stem flow. Now, after that, that's the interesting part. There are two movements right now. There's something called the vertical movement and something called the horizontal movement. Okay, so what is the vertical movement? Well, let's get down to here. The vertical movement, this one is called in infiltration. The word infiltration means that water will slowly infiltrate into where? It will infiltrate into the soil. So infiltration is water flowing into the soil. Now there are rocks at the bottom of the soil. Usually these are your bed rocks and these bed rocks can be either permeable or impermeable. Permeable meaning it allows water to go through. Impermeable means it does not allow water to go through. So if they were permeable, that word we'll call percolation. So percolation is the process where water flows into the ground. Into where? Well, it flows into something called the, ooh, I was gonna change color, didn't allow, allow me. Aquifer, put a square around that. This is soil, yeah, we'll put a square around that too. So those are what we call the vertical flow. The vertical flow, it flows downward. Now, horizontal flow, we have this one that flows on the surface. Guess what it's called? It's obviously called surface run off. Easy, easy, easy. Surface, surface run off. Now, what if it infiltrated first and then flow? Now that will be called through flow. And what do we call the last bit? The last bit, oh, I'm gonna mute my phone because it's actually disturbing me. The last bit is what happens if it flow after percolation? Well, that's usually called groundwater. Groundwater, did I just spell? Groundwater. Flow, or sometimes people call it base flow. Well, that's pretty much it for the beautiful hydrological cycle. Now, here's the thing, when we jump back into our syllabus, this is what we have to consider. We have to consider stores. And the reasons 
why I put a square bracket or a square and use a different color for the word soil and aquifer. These are where water will be stored in a hydrological system or yeah. So soil, soil moisture is a storage. It's, it's counted as a storage for water. Same with an aquifer or groundwater or whatever you like to call it. That is also a store. These two store are mainly focusing on underground, whereas we also have surface storage. Surface storage, I would suggest that there are two things. The first one is called lake. So everyone know what a lake is, right? L-A-K-E. Yeah, so it's a body of water where you can go swim or pedal in it or whatever. The other one is written in the syllabus, but this word you have to learn. It's called a cryosphere. Cryosphere just means ice, frozen. It means that water are frozen, fresh water are frozen on the surface, usually on the top of mountain or glacier, and that acts as a store. Why does it act as a store? Because over time, you know, in the summertime, it will melt, it will refill the aquifer, and that is something for another day. But that's the concept you have to learn about what exactly is this. Vegetation here could also be a store because Think about cactus, they store water. Yep, so that is pretty much it. So the whole idea of this lesson is to us, for you guys to understand the hydrological cycle, why it is a system, what are the input, what are the output, and the difference between a vegetative and an unvegetative surface, as well as the different types of flow that is happening, the different types of action that is happening within the water cycle. So that's pretty much it for this short quick video. I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out. This is Ringo from Edsphere. Bye-bye.